It makes me feel less alone, and it makes me feel less of a freak, you know, because sometimes, you know, when you're feeling sick and you're disgusted with yourself and everything like that, you know, you feel like a freak, you know, but when, when people are sharing it in the circle, then you realize, you know, I'm just a human being, just like everybody else, you know, and um, they, they, all these people were there for me, you know, all those counselors and, and the, 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 the sharing circles and, and the spiritual advisors and everything like that, you know, uh, they, they gave so much to me, you know, and um, that's why I'm sitting here right now, you know, because I asked them, how can I thank you for all you have given me? And they said, well, share this with other people. And so I hope that I'll be able to, to share something, something, you know, that you can take away with you, you know, that will make you feel stronger and uh, healthier. And uh, anyway, so that's that to me, you know, the best medicine is one another. I just want to share one tiny little story about the, um, uh, the, the concept of uh, being one another's medicine is I went to this elders gathering in Lytton and we went to this place uh, where uh, apparently the medicine people went up there you know, to do their ceremonies and to learn of one another and uh, somebody got up and talked and they said uh, we don't have very many healers anymore. We don't have uh, very many people you know, that have been taught how to heal uh, the people. And, uh, but the Creator always provides us with everything that we need, and we need healers. And so the, the Creator provided healers uh, by uh, we being he one another's healers. So that's where we are each other's medicine people. And I just uh, I want to follow up on that a little bit. You're talking about the importance of uh, other people and being together. I remember speaking to you a while ago, you said that something about the importance of ceremony and gatherings and how uh, that's the reason why um, you know, that's really what's holding Aboriginal people together. Oh yeah, that, that reminds me of another story. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, uh, sharing my views you know, by telling stories. So uh, I went to this uh, residential school healing uh, place uh, over on Vancouver Island at uh, this place called Sakolutin. Uh, that, that place really, really had an impact on me, you know, even more stronger of an impact than, than uh, Round Lake did. I kind of did things backwards there, you know, because really, you know, all my troubles started, you know, when I went to residential school. And uh, that's why I drank and, and did, did all kinds of awful things after that. But uh, while I was there, I was in a circle and I talked to the people about um, how it bothered me to go to funerals at home. And I didn't want to go to them anymore. You know, because most of the people, you know, that died usually died because of alcohol or, or something like that, you know. And uh, it broke my heart, you know, because like if I um, continued to go to that, it would just remind me over and over again, you know, about uh, the difficulties our people are having, you know, with uh, their addictions and uh, the, the, the ways that they need to heal themselves. And so I stopped going, you know. I remember the worst experience was when my favorite cousin died, you know, she was just like my aunt, eh? And I was home when she died. But when they brought her body home, you know, I was all ready to support her children and all that. But I jammed out, you know, and I came back to Vancouver. I couldn't do it. You know, because uh, it just broke my heart. You know, she uh, had gotten hurt. You know, because she passed out. You know, while she was drunk, and and the couch that she was laying on burned, and uh, so she she died as a result of those burns. And uh, it was just awful. You know, I came back here, and and I know how the family must have felt. You know, because they really depended on me to to stay, but I didn't. I came back here, and I I just uh, dealt with it the best way I could. And I uh, didn't feel, I never felt right about it, you know, but uh, I just, you know, it was just what I did that time, you know, I felt I had to do it. So I shared this story, you know, in that circle, and there was a couple of um, healers there from, uh, from the States. And a um, couple of days went by, you know, and then that healer got up and uh, he said, um, it's very, very important 
to be there for your people, for your community. When, when somebody dies or gets married or somebody's born or whatever, you know, because that's what keeps you strong. You know, it pulls the people together, you know, and uh, you know, you could tell that, you know, when somebody dies in your community, everyone shows up and there's food all over the place and, and uh, it's just amazing, you know, all the people that come out of the, wood, the woodwork, you know, it just, uh, it just reflects, you know, on, on the person that passed away, you know, how much uh, the people in the community just love that person. And uh, I, I never cease to be amazed every time I go to their, so, their ceremonies. And uh, so I've been going to all these uh, throughout my life, you know, and it was just something, you know, that was normal. And, and, and then I just stopped. And then he says, uh, if we stop uh, doing that and we don't uh, show our children the importance of these ceremonies, you know, by, by not attending anymore, uh, what will they have, you know, when, when they go through life, you know, and experience difficulties in that? You know, they won't have their traditions to fall back on. And he said, the reason why we're alive today is because of those traditions. We wouldn't be here in this room, in this school. We'd all be dead if it wasn't for those traditions. People have tried so hard to kill us off, you know, like with those I hear stories about those smallpox uh, blankets, you know, and the only good Indians, the dead Indian, all that, you know, and, and they tried so hard to kill us off, but they couldn't do it. And he said that the reason why nobody could kill us, you know, was because we had our traditions and we had this way of, uh, of getting together, you know, as family, as community, as nation. And that's what kept us strong, and that's what, uh, why we're alive. And so if we don't do that, you know, if we don't practice our traditions, you know, then our children won't have that medicine, you know, and uh, they're gonna have hard times, you know. Things aren't gonna be easy for them, you know, because as, as time evolves, you know, uh, things change, and with change, you know, it's always a lot of pain and, and difficulty and everything like that, you know, before they get to where they, they want to go, you know. So I, I, you know. So now, you know, I, I keep that in mind. You know, I, I still can't always go when uh, somebody dies because people have been dying left and right. You know, all, all the people that I grew up with. You know, my friends, uh, people that are my age, they're all gone. I'm the only one left. You know, and uh, so how do I get around, you know, like uh, if, I, if I went home every time someone died, uh, I'd be going home, you know, every, every three or four days. You know, I can't do that, you know, so I pray from over here. But I make sure, you know, that uh, when somebody dies around here or, or is going through some really, really important uh, thing in their life, I'm there. That's the reason why I go to all the gatherings here in Vancouver. You know, because uh, to me, you know, that's uh, still practicing my traditions. So that's how I get around that. Thank you. And um, you mentioned uh, that you are have been sober now for 21 years, was it? Can you tell us? Uh, I remember you telling me a, a pretty remarkable story about how your your journey in terms of your own struggle with addictions. I think that'd be helpful. If people heard about that. Okay, um, I'll tell you my story about that. Um, while I was growing up, I, I, um, I used to watch uh, our adults uh, drinking. Uh, my mother, my uncles, uh, people in the community. And it was very, very distasteful to me. I never, ever wanted to drink. And I promised myself, you know, that I never, ever would. My cousin, um, that I was very, very close to, and I, as a matter of fact, made a pact, a blood pact, and we promised never, ever to drink and never be like uh, our, our relatives, you know, our older relatives. And, uh, but I, you know, she kept her promise. She's never, ever drank a day in her life. But I broke down when I was 29 years old. And uh, I broke down because I was, uh, because I was heartbroken. I couldn't take it anymore. I had uh, gone through an abusive relationship 
uh, it, that was added on to the abusive uh, experiences I had in residential school and in foster care and all that. And it just caught up to me. You know, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I, I thought I must be just worth nothing. I really felt like I was worth nothing. So, what is the worst thing that a person can do when they don't feel worth it? To do things, you know, that they know aren't right. And I thought that drinking was the worst thing that I could ever do to myself. And I wanted to punish this guy that, that beat me up, you know, because he was always so proud of me not drinking. So I decided I'm going to drink. So I drank for 13 years. I was, it was horrible, you know, like I just got right into it and hold back. Just like everything else I do in my life, I don't hold back. I didn't hold back on drinking either. I didn't care. My poor little girls, you know, they had to, to suffer through that. But I just thought, well, I'm not a good mother anyway, you know. And um, so anyway, uh, this one day, I was uh, hungover. I was sick. My daughter, you know, she was 13 years old at the time, my younger daughter. And um, she wanted to go down to the bar and use their pay phone. We, did, we had a new house and it didn't have a phone yet. So uh, every February the 7th, we would go down and, and phone her grandmother in Edmonton and um, ask how her dad was because it was his birthday. And I never broke my promise, you know, in the 13 years, you know, that she, you know, was my daughter, you know, I always brought her down there. And um, we were walking along, it was a beautiful winter night, you know, the snow was there and, and it was just gorgeous. And uh, she's walking along beside me and she's just chirping around, you know, really happy, you know, like a, a happy little bird, you know, and I'm walking along feeling really sick, you know, but but happy too, you know, because it was so beautiful and I was with her and I was doing something that she wanted me to do. And uh, I started listening to her, you know, and I thought, she should be happy like this all the time, not just once in a while. She should be happy like that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year, all, all her life. Not just once in a while, you know, when I, I can, force myself, you know, to, to do things for her like this. And I said, why am I doing this anyway? I started doing this because I wanted to punish this man. And, you know, I hadn't even seen him in 13 years. You know, he'd never seen me drunk. So I realized, you know, I was doing it to myself. I wasn't doing it to him. I was doing it to my girls too, you know, but, you know, mainly I was doing it to me. I was losing out on watching my daughter be happy. And I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Never. And I have kept my promise since then. And uh, just want to add a little bit to that story, you know, when I, I went to, to treatment center three times and each time I broke down like maybe about six months after. But um, one of the counselors told me, you know, that if I really, really wanted to succeed, I have to stay away from my, my drunken friends, to stay out of the bar. Because I'd go straight back to the bar, you know, and sit there, drink Coke or whatever, eh? But I would always end up breaking down. I was putting myself in, in a position, you know, where I would break down, eh? And um, so I, I th that, when I finally decided, you know, I'm going to be serious, I uh, told my friends, uh, I'm not going to hang around with you for about six months. You know, I have to stay away from you. I had to stay out of the bar, you know, and uh, so I did that. And um, some of the friends, you know, that uh, I had resented me, they wouldn't have anything to do with me, you know, like they figured, oh, you know, you're just on some kind of high horse or something like that. So I, I found out that they weren't my true friends. But the ones that uh, stuck by me, you know, and praised me and encouraged me and were happy for me, I knew they were my friends. 
So I went into the bar with these people that were my friends and um, had my coke. And uh, they were happy to be with them, that I was with them again. But as the evening wore on, I was sitting there in the beginning of the, of the evening, you know, with my true friends, you know, that, uh, that I was happy to be with. But as the night wore on, they changed to the point, you know, where I just didn't know who they were because the booze made them different people and it freaked me out, you know, and I just thought, no, I can't, I can't come in the bar anymore. I can't come in here with you, you know, when you're drinking. I, if you want to be with me, you know, we got to go have coffee or, or go to my place or something like that, you know, because I can't come in here with you. I couldn't stand to see that transformation, you know, so anyway, that's, uh, how my journey into not uh, drinking anymore started. You said uh, one of the things that's important to you are, is, is nature and animals in terms of the spirituality that you, you have. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you use that? A lot of these things are real hard to talk about, you know, because they're personal, eh? But the way that I, um, I look at uh, animals, to me, you know, they're very, very important teachers. You know, because they all have a gift, you know, like for example, I really admire the, the eagle because it uh, teaches me, you know, how to look at the overall picture. And uh, I like mice, you know, because they, they teach you how to look at detail, you know. So when you look at the animals, you know, they all have different gifts, you know, that, that they share with you. And I also believe that they're here to protect us, you know, they're helpers, you know, of the Creator. You know, so there. That's why I think that uh, a lot of people carve and and do art and everything like that. You know, because it's a way of honoring the people or these uh, these animals. You know, and their their medicine. And uh, that's pretty well kind of like a vague way of describing how I feel about that. And uh, right now, you know, there's some animals that are really important to me. You know, one is the cougar. You know, which to me represents uh, courage. Uh, a lot of the things I've had to do in life, you know, were really, really scary. You know, like uh, getting into the healing program, for example, and, and having to be honest with myself, you know, because I really had to be honest with myself while I was in treatment. You know, I had to look at things about myself that were really ugly and, and uh, truths, you know, that were just uh, horrible. And, and um, you know, like th there's a lot of things I had to forgive myself for. And uh, so that's why I, I like the cougar, you know, because it gives me courage to do all that. And um, right now, the other thing that's really important to me, you know, is a hummingbird, you know, because to me, the hummingbird is, um, it represents love and, and uh, kind of like the spirit world, you know, and uh, the reason why hummingbirds uh, mean that to me is because it was a bird that was very important to my mother. My mother had a special connection with birds, hummingbirds especially, you know, she had this, uh, this uh, hummingbird feeder or bird feeder outside on her porch and uh, they used to come over and talk to her. They literally came over and talked to her and uh, she would put food on her finger and the hummingbird uh, would eat right from her finger. And there was this bird that used to come visit her every day and, and they would talk to her and she'd talk and bird talk to her. And they'd it was like they were really having a conversation. And uh, I just want to say too, you know, my mother uh, went to the spirit world on January 31st. And uh, so I've been really, really thinking about her a lot uh, lately. And um, so it's, it's been since uh, she passed away, you know, that the hummingbird's really special. And, and uh, I believe that my mother is there with me, you know, when I need her. And uh, I noticed that whenever I really, really need her, hummingbirds appear, you know, either, you know, on somebody's handbag or, or somebody gives me a pair of earrings or a picture or something, you know. So I'm constantly thinking about her and uh, remembering all the, all the strengths that she passed on to me. And um, the different, different animals mean different things to me at different times, you know, it just depends on, on what I need. And, um, you said the other parts of nature, uh, just... Uh, you, you mentioned your, your mother, or your, was it your grandmother, who 
knew a lot about traditional medicines, and she would uh, she would cook with them, and then your and then your daughter picked that up as well. Oh yeah, that was kind of neat, you know. Like uh, I didn't really talk too much about the medicines and that, you know, because I didn't know too much about it myself. But I remember my grandmother uh, standing over the stove, boiling all these twigs and roots and leaves, and making all these different. Uh, things for people, you know, whenever, and jarring them, you know, so that uh, if they needed something, she'd have it ready. Uh, I don't know what half of it was for, you know, a lot of it had to do with colds or, or if somebody had a sprained ankle or something like that, you know, she'd have some kind of a poultice ready for them. And, um, and then as, uh, when my daughter was uh, living with me, she, she moved away for a while, you know, and she moved back and, uh, she'd learned a lot of things on her own while she was gone, eh? So there she was, you know, standing over the stove, boiling all these leaves and, and roots and, and uh, you know, whatever. And it just reminded me of my grandmother, you know? And I thought, wow, you know, she's uh, inherited this naturally from, from, from um, her great-grandmother. No, great-great-grandmother. And I was so impressed with that, you know, and that, like she's really done a lot of work, eh? Uh, she's, um, I'm so proud of her, you know, because she's uh, out there for the people, eh? Um, ever since she was 11 years old, you know, she's been an activist. And uh, she's, she's done so much, you know, to, to earn some kind of an honor. So I asked my mother, uh, I told her about the story about her boiling all these things and making medicine and stuff like that, teas and, and I asked her, I said, do you think it would be good if we gave her my grandmother's uh, native name uh, as an honor, you know, because she's so much like her, you know, so hopefully, you know, soon, you know, we'll be able to, to give her that name, Shiaznak. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that some students have submitted. So this one comes from Louise Wilson, and she asks, with a busy life, what are some tips that you use to balance a healthy life with everything you need to get accomplished? Uh, on that, uh, I'm very busy myself, you know, like sometimes I feel like I'm gonna go crazy. Um, I don't really know what I'm doing half the time. You know, so um, I guess uh, a lot of people are in the same boat, day. Eh? you know, I know that. And uh, so what I make a point of doing is I take some time, time out. I got I to gotta remove myself from all these activities, uh, go home or, or go down to the water or something and clear my, myself. I, I, that's when I have a smudge or, or I just go down the water and I just uh, meditate and I uh, take time to process all these things that I'm doing. And uh, sometimes I don't even know why I'm doing them, you know, but when I go and process, I find out, you know, oh, that's why I was doing it. It kind of gets me back on track and uh, sort things out, you know, so take some time out. Great, thank you. And one more question, this comes from Melanie Lockhurst, and her question is, if you could change one thing regarding peer interaction, what would it be? <laughs> okay, uh, that one, I think, uh, I think that one of the biggest problems that people have um, th with their peers is, um, is, to ju is to judge one another. You know, don't judge one another. You know, we all learn at different paces. We're all in different stage in life, you know. Sometimes, you know, we're, we have a meeting of the minds and we just feel like we connect and then we move away, you know, move and, and go learn something else and, and then you feel disconnected again and, and uh, you know, just back and forth, back and forth, you know. And, and sometimes that can be really uh, bad on a relationship. And uh, so just be there for, for one another and celebrate, you know, all the, one another's accomplishments, uh, encourage one another, uh, give each other the unconditional love, you know, that, uh, that uh, you have. Because uh, we, you know, like I said before, you know, we're all... Uh